it's a pleasure. It's really a joy to be back in Aspen. This is my third consecutive year here uh, in Aspen, at Aspen. And I am indeed going to try and, and tell you a story tonight. It's a story with a peculiarly political slant, I suppose, um, but nonetheless is about stories, is about why we can't have a view of our social life if we don't have a view of the narrative that's created it. When I was here for Winter Words a couple of years ago, I had offered to do three different lectures, and I wasn't sure which one to do. So I decided at the last minute to do all three at once. I gave 20-minute versions of three different books. Um, and my kids thought it was the only good lecture they'd ever heard me do. Um, tonight, I'm going to do something similar. I'm going to compress the contents of my new book into a kind of uh, uh, narrative that's almost like an amusement park ride in, in many ways. This is the the thing that we do as writers, we give away the content of our books so you have no reason to buy it except as an ornament to put on your shelf. But this is a story, a series of stories about the making of a particular kind of vision. And it's a story that got started, got impelled, as they like to say in screenwriting classes. The inciting incident of this story was the, I suppose the inciting incident of many of our lives recently. And one reason why a storyteller like myself has taken a more pointedly political turn than I've ever taken before in my life. Uh, this story begins on the night of the November 2016 election uh, when uh, our liberal New York family uh, went through what closely resembled Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's uh, stages in the acceptance of approaching mortality, um, shock, surprise, bargaining, and eventual acceptance, uh, if we haven't quite got there yet. But I was watching my 17-year-old daughter, Olivia, in particular, an extraordinarily bright and passionately uh, social and political person, and I could see that she was freaked out by what was happening. She was literally beginning to, to tremble. Uh, and I looked at her, and I wanted to ease her difficulty. Now, she wasn't freaked out, I should say, instantly, nor would I have been even momentarily sympathetic to her, had she been, because of a change in political parties in power. One of the lessons I had always wanted her to learn was exactly that the oscillation of parties in power is as natural in a democracy as rain, as changing weather. And it's something that we have to learn to internalize as always a positive and uh, powerful, uh, powerfully uh, educational uh, event uh, is one of the reasons why uh, one of the great moments in the recent history of liberal democracy was John McCain's beautiful concession speech on the night when Barack Obama was elected, an act of liberal democratic grace of the deepest kind to remind us that the oscillation of power, the transfer of power, is uh, a beautiful rather than an alarming thing. No, she wasn't upset by that, nor would I have allowed her to be. She was traumatized, freaked out in her own word, by the sudden specter of a kind of authoritarianism that she had been brought up to believe had been defeated, largely banished from the world. And it was, to be blunt, an authoritarianism with a particularly predatory cast. And it freaked her out, shocked her. So I said, let's turn off the television, darling, and let's just go out for a long walk and let me talk to you. Let's talk to each other. And I put my arm around her. She's already taller than I am. Everyone is taller than I am. And I said to her, darling, let's go out and walk and talk. And I spent the next two hours, 1 a.m. to 3 a.m., on the streets of our Manhattan neighborhood, uh, reassuring her. I reminded her that political conviction comes from the ground up, it doesn't pass from power on down. That if we have communal conviction and great social capital, then no one politician, no leader, bad or good, can fundamentally alter it. I pointed to her significant instances in history that she might already have read that suddenly would be newly animated with meaning because of the night's events. And I reminded her that only her generation could make significant change in the years ahead. And we came home 
with her chin higher and her heart fuller. Not one bit, not even remotely. Um, you cannot reassure a 17-year-old who is freaked out about a public event. And I noticed that about, oh, I don't know, 20 minutes into my oration on the street, she had already looked away to her phone in her hand where the steady stream of OMFGs coming from other 17-year-olds was far more engaging and significant to her than any words her epigrammatic father could possibly find. The truth is I had only seen the top of her head for the previous three years as she looked at her phone and tonight was no different. But the task, the enterprise, the desire stayed with me for the next two years. The desire to write a letter to my daughter who was leaving home to go to college, not about politics as such, not offering some platform, not pretending to be the pundit that I am not, but trying to describe to her, trying to communicate to her the significance of the liberal and humane values that I had tried to raise her and her brother with, that my own father had taught to me, to explain to her why these values were not a matter of a family uh, heraldry, why they were not simply passing club-like political ideas that adhered to a particular elite economic class or educated group. No, why these ideas, why the ideas that were at the core of liberal democracy were indispensable and deeply essential, and above all, how they rose not from abstract ideas about the conduct of government, but from actual living and passionate stories about people seeking to make sense of their world and seeking to make a better world. Now, there are a million different ways to tell the story of liberalism. You can begin in the 17th century with the great makers, Locke and Montesquieu, of ideas about organized government. You can begin uh, even earlier with my own hero, the great philosopher Montaigne, who was, to my mind, the real beginner of the liberal imagination, the first man who insisted that it was our failability that gave us commonality. It was the reality that we are all hopelessly divided against ourselves that made compassion the first principle of human conduct. But I wanted to begin, I wanted to create this genealogy for Olivia a little bit later. I wanted to take her on a kind of liberal Pirates of the Caribbean ride that would stretch out from the 19th century when the idea of liberalism first began to converge with the way we use it today in our ordinary speech. And the first people I wanted her to meet on this e-ride, on this conveyor belt that would take her by human beings, living and loving couples, because liberalism is a fact-first philosophy that has a feelings-first history. And the first feeling, an astonishing couple, I wanted her to meet were there in the 1830s, sitting on a bench in the London Zoo. And they were John Stuart Mill and Harriet Taylor. Now, John Stuart Mill is a name I'm sure you've all heard at some point in college or high school. By far the greatest liberal philosopher who's ever lived by general consensus. But he always said that his greatest teacher, his highest inspiration, the greatest liberal philosopher who he had ever met was his lover, and eventually, but only eventually, his wife, Harriet Taylor. Now, for a hundred years, male scholars insisted, well, they did what they did to another John. They kind of yokoed Harriet Taylor to, to invent a verb. <laughs> they insisted that he was so smitten with her that he vastly overrated her intellectual powers. But fortunately, new generations of feminist scholars have shown us that she was every bit the mind and the contributor and the original that her husband always insisted that she was. But in the years of the 1830s, they had met at a dinner party and instantly fallen in love. But she was married to a decent man named John Taylor and had three children, and they couldn't yet find a way to live together 
and to love each other. Now, there's a debate among scholars of Mill and Taylor about whether they had actually made love at this point in their lives. They had been to Paris together, and my own theory is no two people go to Paris together for a week and come home entirely virtuous and chaste. It's simply not a possibility. But that's a debate in Mill studies. You can look it up. When I want you to meet them, when I wanted Olivia to meet them, it was because they were sitting on this bench in the London Zoo in the 1830s in front of the rhinoceros cage. The rhinoceros had come to London only a few years before. The first rhinoceros came to the London Zoo in 1826. So it was still an event. It was still a phenomenon, the rhinoceros. And they decided that that was the place that they would make their clandestine trysting place. And they would pass each other notes saying, we might want to meet our old friend Rhino this afternoon. Meet me at 2 p.m. near our old friend Rhino. Because with a kind of syllogistic insight given only to first-rate philosophical minds, they had realized that the safest place in London for a clandestine couple to do their courting was on the bench in front of the rhino's cage because everyone would be looking at the rhino and no one would be looking at the people sitting on the bench. And so they sat there afternoon after afternoon talking, conversing, and thinking, sharing ideas that at that moment in history were revolutionary, radical, extreme. John Stuart Mill, of course, was percolating, synthesizing, distilling the set of ideas that later would become the foundational statement of the liberal creed. And that, of course, is the great book on liberty, which he would publish just after her death, tragically. Eventually, they did get married in 1859. It was exactly the same publishing season, and I believe the same publishing house that published Darwin's On the Origin of Species that same year. Now, that's a good publishing season when you have On the Origin of Species and On Liberty on one list. Good, good back titles. And in that book, of course, Mill made the case, the most passionate and powerful case that exists for the absolute unimpeded right of each of us, for each individual, to speak his or her mind freely and without impediments, without even the corralling of blasphemy. There is no idea so perfect, Mill insisted, that it does not improve from critical scrutiny. There's no human being so ideal that he does not benefit from critical inspection. And there's no possibility that simply the play of words can ever do me real harm. I benefit from having my pet ideas insulted and my favorite ideologies criticized. That's how I learn. That's how I focus my mind to defend my ideas. Greatest statement of the necessity of free speech. Now, people had been talking about free speech and people had been talking about liberty of expression for a very long time. It's in our Constitution was part of the inheritance. But no one before had ever made so absolute a case for free speech, and no one before had ever made a case so passionately and so poetically, the thing people often forget, that the real end of liberty is not simply the betterment of society on some purely material grounds. No, the real end of liberty is for each of us to become wholly fulfilled in ourselves, to be able to express the richness and the potential that we all feel to write poetry or listen to Mozart or do whatever our heart desires with as few impediments as can be put in our way. The greatest statement we have, not just of utilitarian or instrumental liberty, but of deep existential and aesthetic liberty. And yet, at the same time, on that same bench, Harriet Taylor was filling Mill's mind with her own ideas that had kindled in the crucible of her own experience as a married woman. And she said, there's not a woman alive who has not had to submit herself to the tyranny of some petty autocrat of the dining room. <laughs> women's rights, women's liberty was not merely circumscribed, but amputated, eliminated, 
by the social system of her time and her day. And it was her ideas on this reality that led them together to write one of the first and still most potently passionate tracks for complete, the complete equality of the sexes, that great book on the subjection of women, written earlier, though published later. There had been tracks and there had been manifestos for women's equality before, but none had insisted so radically and absolutely on complete equality between the sexes within the framework of a liberal democratic society in which the government, the state, would move to enforce such equality. And they were, Mill and Taylor, absolute about it. It wasn't just that women should have more chances to participate in social and political roles. It wasn't just that women should be encouraged to do more and to have more. No, they posited an absolute equality of the sexes in every imaginable social, aesthetic, and economic sphere. We're still struggling to catch up with the radicalism of that vision. If you think about it at all, those two books map the real project and the real potential of the liberal vision. It's why this moment begins the kind of liberalism that we identify today, because it's premised not on one, but on two different and seemingly opposed ideas. On the one hand, on the idea of individual liberty, our freedom to speak, express ourselves, and fulfill ourselves as we like, and at the same time, on an idea of social equality, on an idea of ever-increasing social equality, the notion that I cannot be free to speak, to fulfill myself, if others are still chained. I can't have a satisfactory experience of liberty if it is not as widely shared as it is possible. It's the sentiment that still motivates Bruce Springsteen every time he ends a concert with those words, if nobody wins, unless everybody wins. That was the liberal project as Taylor and Mill imagined it on this bench outside the rhinoceros cage. And people said then, and people will say to this day, that it's contradictory, it's impossible. Every time you try to increase individual liberty, you necessarily interfere with social equality. You try and promote social equality, it necessarily curbs individual liberty. But the distinct originality of their vision was that they saw that those two things could proceed together. It was as if, one of them said, like a tightrope walker. A tightrope walker knows no contradiction between the task of walking forward on the tightrope and the task of keeping balanced on the tightrope. We don't call that a contradiction. We say that is what tightrope walking is. That's why we watch it. That's why we value it. And they saw in the same way the project for liberalism to always be able to keep in balance the demands of individual liberty of the most absolute kind and the dream of social equality of the most radically egalitarian sort. That was what this simple courting clandestine couple on the bench outside the rhinoceros cage began to envision those new principles. And as I thought about them and I thought about the beauty of their love story because they decided, finally, that she could not leave her husband. Her husband and her children depended on her. And therefore, they worked out a beautiful compromise in which Mill would live in the house and pay for all the wine, and her husband would remain, and together they would pay for the food. And they found a way to combine those loves. And they realized that it's in the nature of human existence to demand a beautiful compromise very often that we cannot live fully unless we're prepared to conciliate our own passions and desires to those of other people. They understood that a compromise is not a weak retreat away from principle. No, a compromise is more often a knot tied tight between competing decencies. And so into their vision of a new kind of liberalism, a liberalism of principle, they incorporated a new and beautiful principle of conciliation and compromise rooted not in abstract ideas, but in their own intensely lived experience. John Taylor died finally, and for too brief a time, six years, they were able to marry 
and live in France. When I thought about this extraordinary couple on their bench, I thought about the rhinoceros that they watched. And I realized that the rhinoceros was the perfect heraldic image of the liberal inheritance that I valued and wanted to share with Olivia. What is a rhinoceros after all? Well, a rhinoceros is, among other things, the real life coordinate of the unicorn. That's how we get the idea of the unicorn. Travelers would go off to Africa and they would see the rhinoceros, big pig with a horn in the middle of its head. And they would do what we all do when we come home and people ask questions. They would cosmeticize the experience. They would say, oh, there's this beautiful animal. It's white and silver and it has a beautiful long mother of pearl horn on its forehead. And the unicorn entered the world of fable and art through that misdescription. And we began to idealize unicorns. We began to mythologize unicorns. We have unicorn tapestries and unicorn fables. The only problem with the utopian unicorn is that it doesn't exist. It never has existed. The great virtue of the ugly, squat, badly made, awkward, unglamorous rhinoceros is that it does exist, and it's a formidable animal in operation. In the same way, the liberalism that Mill and Taylor dreamed of was, they knew, one of compromise, conciliation, possibilities, and practicalities. It was a radicalism, yes, but it was a radicalism of the real. It was a rhinoceros radicalism, not a unicorn utopianism. I wanted Olivia to meet that couple and come to appreciate them not as abstract thinkers, but as passionately engaged and living lovers. But there were other people I wanted Olivia to meet just as well. I wanted her to step back in time and come with me to a deathbed in Edinburgh in 1776, where the great Scottish philosopher David Hume lay dying what seems to have been a kind of colon cancer. <clears throat> and he was accompanied night after night by his one closest friend, the other great philosopher, Adam Smith. Now, Hume's dying was an enormous event in European intellectual life because Hume, of course, was a confessed infidel, someone who doubted the certainties of faith. And everyone was convinced that once he had to face the fact of his own extinction, that he would turn back to faith in terror and in fear. But he did just the opposite. He lay on his deathbed for a very long time, dying, and all he did was talk and reflect. And his favorite companion was his best student, Adam Smith. And Smith made notes on the things that they talked about, the things that they reviewed as Hume lay dying. And one of the things they talked about and one of the things that they had shared throughout their life was their common belief in the power of social sympathy, in that power of human sympathy, to act as a spark that would unite people in common pursuits in the face of all of the uncertainties of clan and blood, that we could escape our ancient history in which we only felt that we could trust people with whom we share genes and religion if we recognized, encouraged, and cultivated that spark of sympathy that's residual, they felt, in every human breast. Now, when I'm giving this talk, usually, someone in the front row has a seizure right about here. This is true. It's happened twice in the last 10 days. It tells you something about the median age of my listeners, I suppose. <laughs> and what happens is really interesting. This happened in Cambridge, and it happened again in Seattle. Um, what happens is interesting. Everybody goes running immediately to the aid of the afflicted. It's the most natural first thing we do. We are not always able to help the afflicted. We may, in fact, be encumbering them with assistance. Nonetheless, it's a profound and immediate reaction that we have. We don't ask, is he of our kind? We don't ask, is he a relative? We simply go and try and help. That's the simple spark of human sympathy that both Smith and Hume believed a society could be built of and should be built of, that it didn't depend on a hierarchy falling from heaven, that societies depended instead on the sudden horizontal infection and electricity 
of human sympathy flying from one to the next. Now, Adam Smith, one of the great liberal thinkers, had incorporated that idea into his whole conception of the free market. We're blinded to that reality now. No one will tell you that. But it's a profound and powerful truth. Adam Smith, of course, is famous as the author of that great book on the wealth of nations, which is indeed foundational to our understanding of how a free market is not only a source of prosperity, but also a way in which a society can be self-organizing, self-emerging, as we sometimes say, that out of each of our desires and needs, it's possible for a complicated network of improvement, social betterment to exist. But Smith understood that before that kind of economic improvement could take place, we had to have powerful social institutions. And so he wrote a book before he wrote On the Wealth of Nations, which is foundational to that book. It's called On the Theory of Moral Sentiments. And in it, he took Hume's powerful idea that sympathy is the first and primary human emotion and talked about how only when we're able to build institutions of trust, uh, commonalities, whether they're as small as a club or as large as a city, that enable us to engage in conditions of mutual confidence with people who are not of our kind, not of our clan, only then can free markets begin to emerge. It isn't that markets make men and women free, no. It's that free men and women are able to move towards markets. That was the core idea of Adam Smith's notion of how economic liberalism could, could be incorporated into a liberalism of principle. I wanted Olivia to hear those two strange Scotch bachelors as they debated these facts in the face of death, in the face of existential crisis, without shame and without seconding them to the false consolations of faith. I wanted her to have that in her life. But then I wanted her to meet still one more loving couple of a slightly later moment and period in British history. Another couple who were courting clandestinely at first and then chose the path utterly audacious in the 1850s and 1860s in Victorian Britain of common law marriage, of declaring themselves married even though no clergyman, no magistrate had pronounced them so. Now, one of those names you probably don't know, George H. Lewis, the man in this marriage, the woman in it, Marianne Evans, you probably do know, but you know her by another name. You know her as George Eliot, the greatest of English novelists. And theirs is another wonderful liberal love story, a story, though, not of the birth of a liberalism of principle, but instead what I call a liberalism of process. Now, they're an absolutely fascinating couple. George Henry Lewis was the greatest theater critic of his age. He's the greatest theater critic in English between Hazlitt and Shaw. And he was an actor. He was the first actor on the English-speaking stage to play the role of Shylock in The Merchant of Venice as a hero rather than a villain. Wonderful writer, omnivorous appetite, a man of surpassing brilliance, but the single most brilliant and surpassing thing he ever did was to recognize that Marian Evans who, when they met, had never published a word of fiction, was a genius, and that he would have to spend his entire life supporting her career as a novelist, encouraging her, pressing her forward, and marrying her, even though he was already married. And they simply announced themselves now to be Mr. and Mrs. Lewis. And Marian Evans wrote to her very straight-laced brother, I have now married George H. Lewis. And he wrote back saying, who performed this marriage? And she said, no one performed this marriage. We are simply Mr. and Mrs. Lewis. Imagine the audacity of that in Victorian London. Lewis, having decided to give up the theater to support his wife and her fiction writing efforts, became engaged in exactly in what I call a liberalism of process. Now, what do I mean by that? How does it distinguish from the earlier generations liberalism of principle. Well, <coughs> excuse me, I mean by it simply that they became aware of the absolute importance of 
slowly developing, slowly maturing, and yet vitally important social projects. Lewis turned to the study of science after he gave up the theater for his wife's career. And he was the one who, in his scientific studies, first articulated what is, for me, the most powerful of liberal ideas. And that's the idea of emergence. You've all heard people talk about emergence, emergent states, emergent systems. And what they mean, simply, is that the elements of which a field or a system are composed are not identical with the larger organization of the system. It sounds a bit abstract. Lewis's favorite instance of it was simply the nature of water. A hydrogen atom and an oxygen atom come together to form water, and yet water has properties and is the subject of a science totally independent from the atomic life beneath it. And Lewis's insight was that all of our social life is emergent in that same way. You don't have to alter, you don't have to change human character, you don't have to interfere with or remake each individual in order to prod humankind forward to a better form of a social system. Now that may sound a little highfalutin. What did it really mean? It meant build a sewer. Build a sewer. George H. Lewis was one of a group of extraordinary Londoners of that time who devoted themselves to the public works project of building a London sewer. Because they recognized that even though they didn't understand why, this is before the germ theory of disease, that every summer a miasma, as they called it, would rise from the River Thames. And it would always be correlated with epidemics, cholera and typhus. And they knew that that stink coming from the river was somehow responsible for the plague that struck the London population, and particularly the London poor throughout the 1850s and 60s. And they determined to build a great public work that might end it. And oh, there, those times there was a great sanitary affairs correspondent for the London Times because everyone understood that it was that significant. And Lewis wrote about it and propagandized for it. And eventually, they did build a great sewer which saved tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, probably by example, millions of lives. That's what I mean by the liberalism of process, understanding that the sewer is the principle. The pipes are the premises of social change. And it's a vision of a slow-moving, incremental, and yet hyper-efficient, and finally, salvationist liberalism that you find in all of George Eliot's works as well. Go back and read that great novel, Middlemarch, again, and you'll see how much it reflects the power of emergence moral emergence. It isn't that great radical poet Dickens' vision of life at all. Dickens thinks that you can take the worst miserly man in London and overnight turn him into the greatest altruist in London if you just give him the right injections of vision. Send ghosts to him, shake him up, and suddenly you'll have a totally transformed individual. It's a beautiful vision. It's a unicorn vision. George Eliot's vision, made under the light of her lover and husband George Lewis's idea of emergence and within the broader orbit of Darwinism. George Eliot's idea is that you can take a woman like Dorothea, the heroine of Middlemarch, and she begins as an innocent girl. And then she becomes a wife full of illusions about her husband. And then she becomes a horribly disillusioned wife. And then she becomes, by increments, reattached to a better man, and then finally becomes something like what we mean by a free and autonomous woman. And yet, the course of this development isn't one that happens through sudden leaps and lurches of the heart. No, it's one that happens through the slow change and evolutionary emergence of a new society that offers new possibilities of feeling and existence to the people within it. That's the vision of emergence, the possibility that we don't have to change everything in our lives to better the way that we live. I wanted Olivia to meet both Lewis and Eliot and understand the power of this principle in our own lives. Because far from being remote, far from being 
historically descriptive only of a time gone by in a city past, it has everything to do with the way the change, positive change, social change, can happen now in our world. I'll give you an example, an instant example from the last 20 or 30 years. If you think about the great crime decline in America, a subject about which I've written often, it's one of the greatest social transformations. It's sort of like the London sewer of our time. 30 years ago, crime was epidemic in America. And now, in a way that's uncelebrated or insufficiently celebrated, we've totally reversed that epidemic of crime. And when sociologists, Patrick Sharkey is one of the leading ones, look at what caused this decline in crime, what they find is that there's no monocausal explanation. It wasn't incarceration because incarcerations go down and crime continues to go down. It wasn't new forms of policing alone because it was generalized across many places. What was it? It seems to have been the production of virtuous circles. It certainly wasn't foundational change. We didn't fix the things we might fix, inequality. We didn't fix broken families, alas. But we did solve this problem because communities began to organize themselves and virtuous circles of the liberalism of process came into operation. The less crime there is on the street, the more people come out. The less crime there is on the New York subway, the more people are riding the New York subway at 1 a.m. The more people on the subway at 1 a.m., the more people there are on the subway at 2 a.m. And crime can take this sudden and vertiginous decline, not through the profound change of individuals, but through what I call in my book, the action of a thousand small sanities, working together in order to make fundamental and radical social change that may even be invisible to our eyes as it's happening because it takes place not through a sequence of violent revolutionary epiphanies, but instead through a sequence of nonviolent, permanent, ongoing, unending reform. Well, I could hear Olivia say to me, because she's a contentious 17-year-old, <clears throat> Dad, these are wonderful examples, and these are inspiring people, and I'm glad to have met them. And yes, I'll always think of you as a rhinoceros. But what does it really have to do with our life now, with the struggles that we face and the problems that we're struggling with? Well, I couldn't, didn't want to give her too much of a contemporary instance <laughs> because she'll make the contemporary world for herself and it's what she experiences every day. But I did want to give her a somewhat more recent and modern model to look at. So I started telling her on this <laughs> trip, I wanted to show her one more liberal hero of mine. <coughs> Excuse me. One more liberal hero, and on a parched throat. And that's a name <clears throat> not enough people conjure with anymore. That was Bayard Rustin. Who was Bayard Rustin? He was one of the great African-American and gay activists of the 1950s and 60s and 70s. He's the man. He said once that he had been in prison 25 times, 24 times for being black and once for being homosexual. And he said that there are three basic dance steps of liberal activism, constitutional means, democratic measures, nonviolent procedures. Those are the three dance steps that combine the liberalism of principle and the liberalism of process that began in the 19th century and motivated and activated the civil rights movement of the 20th centuries of which we are all the lucky beneficiaries. What did Rustin do? Well, Rustin organized the March on Washington in 1963. What does that mean, he organized it? Well, it means he really organized it. He took a utopian idea of a great march that would come to Washington and he made it real. He had been excommunicated from the civil rights movement for being gay because at that time, the struggle for gay rights, which were not even called gay rights then, seemed not to fit within the broader texture of the struggle for civil rights for African Americans. One of Martin Luther King's closest advisors said disparagingly of Rustin, he's only fit to organize a movement of homosexuals, which he did not intend as praise. 
But as the March on Washington seemed stymied, unable to get started, everyone realized they would have to call Rustin back to organize it. Rustin said once, rather mis mischievously, he said, Dr. King is a saint, but he could not organize vampires to go to a bloodbath. Rustin could. Rustin could organize anyone to accomplish anything. And he spent months in a room with a bunch of kids in Harlem worrying about how you got enough buses to Washington on a Friday night and then got enough buses out of Washington on a Saturday night, worrying about how you fed all the people who were riding those buses. He asked himself the questions about how you cut enough sandwiches to feed that number of activists. I said to Olivia, I could have called this book A Thousand Small Sandwiches in his honor. And through that engagement with the tangible particular, with those three dance steps of liberal activism, democratic means, nonviolent procedures, constitutional measures, he was able to create an extraordinary frame in which Dr. King could make that greatest of 20th century speeches and the civil rights movement could take a huge leap forward through his participation in the ongoing march of a thousand small sanities. Rustin went on to be excommunicated again from the civil rights movement for being too insistent on the necessity of coalition building, on the notion that no minority in America, sexual or ethnic, can ever survive or find freedom or liberty by itself but only in concert with, only in coalition with other groups. And that coalition, like compromise, should be a sacred word for liberals rather than a word of retreat and recumbence. I wanted her to meet him. And I wanted her finally to meet the man whose vision lie be lay behind Bayard Rustin's vision. And that is the man who is, for me, the greatest of all Americans. Frederick Douglass, because it was Douglass in the middle of the 19th century who struggled passionately and significantly with the basic push and pull of the call of radical prophetic action against the necessities of liberal coalition building and activism. Oh, and Douglass was inspired and impelled towards absolute radical action throughout his life, greatest of all the abolition leaders, a man who knew what it meant to be a slave and how intolerable it was for a human being to experience that. But at the same time, someone who had chosen the path of American constitutionalism rather than the path of violent terrorism and revolution. At the crucial moment in his life, he had to choose between John Brown and Abraham Lincoln. For John Brown, a man of impeccable moral integrity and authority who understood the horror of slavery, but whose plan was a kind of nihilistic assault on the citadel of slavery. He had to choose between Brown and the path of Abraham Lincoln and the Republican Party, which would necessarily be slow, compromised, full of conciliation with the worst, coalition building with people who you would rather not be in the same boat with, but held out the promise eventually of an actual victory in the struggle against slavery. Douglas chose the path of Lincoln, a path that led him often to states of extreme exasperation, disbelief, disapproval, and yet it finally led to that most beautiful moment in American history after Lincoln delivers his second inaugural address. And Douglas comes to the White House, and Lincoln, who only has a few days to live, says, where is my friend? Not where is Mr. Douglas, not where is Frederick Douglas, but where is my friend? Great moment. And Douglas gave what was the greatest speech of the 19th century, his famous not quite Fourth of July oration, in which he articulated with a kind of moral urgency and passion exactly the same principle of emergence that George H. Lewis was articulating at the same time in the 1850s in Britain, because, Lew because Douglas, looking at the Constitution of the United States, at a moment when his fellow abolitionists, 
were properly and understandably completely disintoxicated with it, completely disillusioned by being asked to respect a document written by slaveholders and upholding slavery, Douglas, in a moment of inspiration, looked at the Constitution and said, it's a wonderful document, it's not for me, but that does not mean it is a bad document. No, he said, the Constitution is a great liberty document. It has not yet fully emerged in all of its moral potentiality. We have not yet fully enacted everything that it articulates about the power of those liberal principles of liberty and equality conjoined. I wanted Olivia to feel the force of that vision, that vision often of impatience with the slow process of liberal change, but at the same time finally making a decisive move to embrace constitutionalism and Rustin's three dance steps of nonviolent action, constitutional means, and democratic procedures, even on the brink of a huge and violent war. I wanted Olivia to be aware as well of the great critics and attacks on liberalism. So I spent a lot of time talking to her about Emma Goldman, the great anarchist thinker, or, and a lot of time talking to her about the great conservative critique of liberalism's incapacity to give us a strong enough sense of community. I had the great pleasure just earlier this afternoon of sitting with Masha Gessen and hearing Masha talk about parallel polices, about how essential it is that we build community within a liberal de democratic state if we're to make real change, how we can model change not only through the acts of individuals but through the creation of smaller commonalities looking forward to greater change. It's as simple as an idea as the existence of uh, uh, Greenwich Village and Stonewall, all those simple ways in which like-minded people, often from different clans and backgrounds, come together to give us a living example of what profound change would look like. I wanted Olivia to see the totality of that, good and bad together. She said to me at last, are you hopeful at all, Dad? And I told her the truth, which is it depends what time of day you get me. In the middle of the afternoon when I'm writing and speaking, I try to infuse my words with hope. At 3 a.m., I'm a rather different man. I said once, I wrote once, that each of us has the philosophy of her insomnia. And what I meant by that is, is that it's what we worry about, what we're frightened of, at 3 a.m. that tells who we really are. We talk ethics and politics and punditry at 3 p.m., but it's not what we feel at 3 a.m. And at 3 a.m., what I always feel and fear is the possible dissolution of this liberal vision, the possible disappearance of liberal democracy itself and of the liberal imagination, despite all of the positive and powerful things, despite its ability historically to create societies of greater prosperity and pluralism than any that mankind has known. There is inside of all of us the plague of tribalism, the virus, as Camus described it, that makes us turn towards our own ethnicity, towards our own group, and turn away from the dream of universalism. I reminded Olivia about an exhibition that we had attended together a few years ago. It was called Jerusalem 1000, and it was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And in that exhibition, one saw very much to my surprise that the three groups who had inhabited Jerusalem at that moment, Jews and Muslims and Christians, had on the whole coexisted rather peacefully rather successfully. Jewish goods made from Muslim markets, Christian illumination sold into Africa, a constant daily intermingling, entangling of very different communities, living side by side, coexisting on the whole successfully. But by the end of that century, the Crusades had begun, 
and massacre succeeded counter-massacre, succeeded counter-massacre, and that precarious coexistence was drowned in a sea of blood. All that the liberal vision tries to do, I wanted to say to Olivia, all that this awkward couple on the bench outside the rhinoceros cage, all that this literary couple choosing the path of each other, all that Frederick Douglass and Bayard Rustin and all the other great liberal visionaries have ever believed is that if we struggle, we can make that normal human practice of coexistence into a permanent principle of pluralism. That liberal vision belongs to no party. It belongs to no person. It's not a political ideology imposed upon life. It's the best we know about life speaking to political ideology. And if we think of it in that way, if we realize that the human content is what makes liberalism count, then it isn't even a walk you have to take around the block. It's two simple steps with your daughter. Thank you very much. Thank you. I've thrown a lot at you. I see we have about a few minutes for me to take some questions, hear some objections, calm some traumas of an Olivia-like kind, clarify foggy ideas, and so on. So let me take that time just to, to have a conversation. Somebody. First question is always the hardest. Must be somebody. Gentleman here. Um, could you wait for a second here? Because microphone, we only have one mic, and we should put it on the mic. Thank you. Oh, we have two mics, I'm told. How, how has um, <coughs> sort of the notion of America as the bastion of capitalism, how have they conflated that with freedom and opposed that to liberalism? Where? Right. Well, one of the themes of my book, and I hope one of the kind of currents of the talk I gave tonight, is that we can, we, that in the, class, in the great liberal vision, I hesitate to say classic, because classic liberalism is used to mean something else, but in the liberal humanist vision, the liberal democratic vision, economics are a modality. That's what Adam Smith actually believed. He believed that, that economics, that the free market is fantastic. It produces enormous prosperity. It can also produce uh, uh, monopoly. It can also produce uh, inequity and that it's a constant job of balancing those two things. He, it was Adam Smith who said that most, uh, 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 how did he put it, that most, uh, he didn't use the word businessmen, most entrepreneurs are a compact against the public good, right? In other words, meaning that they were doing that. And that's one of the themes of the book. I think it's tragic, and we've seen it so clearly in the post-89 history of Eastern Europe and of Russia. It's exactly what Adam Smith was trying to say, if you don't have rich social institutions of trust, if you don't have powerful civic capital, what another one of my liberal heroes, Frederick Law Olmsted, the great park designer who was a journalist, I'm proud to say, before he ever designed a, an inch of park, called commonplace civilization. He said that the well-being of America depends on the strength of our commonplace civilization. If you don't have those institutions of trust in place, then capitalism becomes kleptocracy. And that's a story that we've seen played out tragically in Eastern Europe and particularly in Russia, as Masha Gessen will tell you, over the past 30 years. Someone else. Must be more. Gentlemen here. It sounds good today. Wait, hold on a second. Get a mic in your hand. It sounds good today, the hope for the real liberal position. But the reality of life would suggest that we've gone so far away from that idealism in so many ways that those of us who are politically active people are completely finished. We don't believe it can be reinstated the way you're talking about it. Where is the Great. hope? Where is the hope? You sound like my daughter. Um, <laughs> where is the hope? That's what I tried to answer at the end. It's a great question. It's the question that burned. That's why I said, I have the philosophy of my insomnia, and at 3 a.m., I'm just sitting the way you are, with your hand here and saying, where is the hope? Where is the hope? We live at a moment. Yasha Monk gave a wonderful talk about this last year at Aspen, right on this stage, some of you may have heard, in which 
that vision and liberal democratic values, hostage to no party, hostage to no one person, shared in common by all of us who participate in that story, who participate in that legacy, who believe in the oscillation of parties in power, who believe in liberal institutions, education, free speech, accepting opposition is always legitimate rather than trying to criminalize it and so on, um, are endangered in a way they haven't been in our lifetimes, certainly. Where is the hope? Well, what I always say to Olivia is that at any moment in its history, liberal democracy has looked incredibly weak on the way out and certain to be extinct. I date the birth of the liberalism that I'm evangelizing for, that I believe in and celebrate tonight and in my book, to the 1860s, the end of the American Civil War, the birth of the Liberal Party in England. People forget, I put the Statue of Liberty on the cover of my book, a really original choice. <laughs> but I did it for a reason. It's because people forget what the Statue of Liberty represents. We see it because our grandparents, my grandparents, passed under it as an icon of immigration, American immigration. In fact, it was made by desperate French Republicans in the 1860s, laboring under an autocratic empire who thought, we'll never see a republic again in this country, but we'll pay tribute to the survival of the American Republic. Well, within five years, they had a republic. In France, it's essentially the same republic that has governed the country uh, ever since with some constitutional changes. It worked. It worked. At every moment, liberal democracy looks incredibly weak. In the 1930s, when communism and fascism were on the rise, the majority, the overwhelming majority of intellectuals, people who were educated, believed that liberal democracy was doomed and that one had to take sides in the coming choice between communism and fascism. They were wrong. I'm old enough to remember the Cold War. I remember going down in a Philadelphia school basement uh, to pull all the sh shades because, and this gentleman did as well, because uh, it was possible that Khrushchev could see a little chink of light in a Philadelphia school, and that would give the nuclear weapons even better guidance as they came to get us. And everyone at that time, read Time magazine in 1960, 1961. The consensus is that liberal democracy is weak because it's full of contention and it's full of uncertainty, disorganization and dissent. And Soviet communism is organized, disciplined, forceful, taking the field, conquering Europe. This was true right up to the 1970s. No idea could have been more wrong historically. Liberal democracy, exactly because of its tolerance for dissent, exactly because of its contentious nature, turned out to be not only far more powerful, powerful politically and economically, but infinitely more powerful culturally, which turned out to be vital. And I am also old enough, as all of you are, to remember 9-11. I was downtown in New York on the morning of 9-11 and watched it all happen and walked home with white dust on my shoes to write about it. And at that time, too, we were told again and again, liberal democracy is fatally weak. It's decadent. It's ironic. It's corrupted. What can we possibly do in the face of the fiery passion of religious fanaticism? And that turned out to be completely wrong as well. Not that the fight against religious fanaticism doesn't go on, but we're doing well. We're doing well. We've made that case to the world. So my hope, where does my hope reside? It resides in that history. It resides in the truth that again and again, liberal democracy and liberal values have looked fatally weak. And again and again, they've proved to be more robust and resilient than any other values that have been on the planet at the same time. That's where my hope resides, and we are exactly at zero seconds as that happens. Thank you all for coming, and thank you for listening.